Asia 21, I would say, is a global family of dreamers and thinkers. They're very diverse individuals who are individually quite accomplished. People, that when you meet them, you get inspired by them. Incredibly smart, but incredibly humble people that are working on some of the most pressing issues in their respective countries who have a common heartbeat about making this world a better place, not just by their own strength and their talents, but by the ability to work together. It provides this catalytic platform where they can come together, form lasting friendships, learn from each other, and collaborate to address our shared challenges. Why are we here? We're here because we're a collaborative community that trusts each other, we're family. And the first thing we need to do is, as a community, find out who needs what and how do we help each other. People come not just for themselves, but people come to talk about what they can do together uh, to make our world a better place. Politicians across the board tend to talk more and less concrete action on ground. And I think in countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan, we need to have them, that translate into more on-ground action. It makes for people to understand where people are coming from, understand their challenges, understand their problems, and understand their victories. When I started off playing cricket, it was just like I loved the game. And once I started playing it, I, I just realized it's bigger than just a sport. It's, it's a tool through which we can change the society. My leadership education is being updated every time and every year I come to the annual summit and I try to go back home and implement some of this at work. That's how I look at it. The mayor of LA is an Asia 21 young leader. Ambassador of Afghanistan to Australia is an Asia 21 young leader. They had ministers, Oscar winners, social activists, and I can go on and on. These are all Asia 21 young leaders. They're all part of this network. I am Asia 21. Mama Asia Viseka Sangidane Ma Asia 21. Asia 21. You don't need to be a celebrity to be a podcaster. What you need to be is a storyteller. Someone who thinks in audio because you want to create an experience for your listeners. Like using music to make a point. Or planning the story arc of multiple episodes. Or taking a two-hour interview and distilling it to 20 minutes of key insights. If this sounds nerdy, well, it is. We talk to experts who can nerd out about a topic and we get nerdy about production too. I'm Mark and I can make people sound like they're in a car at a basketball game even in outer space Carl here when I'm not working on the business side sometimes I get the record music for our audio bits I'm Pam of the Philippine Daily Inquirer. With Puma Podcast, I dug through 30 years of our archives to write the award-winning true crime pod, Super Evil. Ako si Macy. I started out as a junior producer. Now, I produce and host my own show. Puma Podcast kami. Kayo na rin! Hello po, kumusta na kayo? Ako po si Robbie Alampay ng Puma Podcast. With the 2022 elections fast approaching, the Filipino people are living 
in crucial times, a crossroads where we have the opportunity to decide the future of our nation. And yet, the challenges we face today are not new. These are issues that the Philippine society has wrestled with across decades. Paano ba? You're watching Kung Gusto Mo ng Pagbabago, the Chito Gascon Leadership Series. In each episode of this five-part series, you will hear from a luminary, somebody who's been an advocate or an activist for a long time, who has led the way for their generation. And then you'll also hear from a panel of young leaders, young change makers who will discuss, who will discuss the challenges we face today. To set the tone of today's discussion, we'll be hearing from, well, what na natin tawaging luminary, oldie na lang daw. He's been involved in human rights work since his, since his student days as a paralegal at the University of the Philippines College of Law. Immediately after becoming a lawyer, he volunteered for the Free Legal Assistance Group, or FLAG, the oldest human rights lawyers network in the country. He is currently the regional coordinator for FLAG Metro Manila. Everyone, welcome, Attorney Ted De. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, magandang uh, araw. And uh, maybe I'd like to introduce myself further as uh, someone who's a prom D. No, I, I studied high school and graduated from a Jesuit school in Cagayan de Oro in Misamis Oriental, the Baylor week of uh, Nene Pimentel. And uh, even then, uh, you know, in high school, I learned early on what the what the issues of the day were. Uh, even in that remote portion of Mindanao, you know, uh, I learned from my 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 teachers, uh, both the Jesuits and the non-Jesuits, what uh, social injustice was all about. I started to read about this concept of, you know, food blockades and hamleting in in Bukidnon, and you know, uh, I my my very young self at the time, you know full of curiosity, uh, was intrigued about uh, what these issues were and what I could do. And so I entered the University of the Philippines as a, as a prom D activist uh, in 1982. The burning issues of the day then at UP were tuition increases, uh, the US basis, and of course, uh, the Nino Aquino assassination during the last days of martial law. I joined my share of rallies uh, on those issues but you know, I never cared enough about the issues, perhaps, as to join a political party and to even run for office. I was content then to just lend my voice to the already loud crowd shouting against tuition increases, a higher government subsidy for the UP, the removal of the US basis, the resignation of Marcos. And later on, I would enter law school, still so enamored of being an activist but I found seemingly no place for me in law school, studying laws that were passed by the dictator. It seems so strange and in fact so revolting for me to be studying presidential decrees and proclamations that had the force and effect of law. You know, my activist background almost led me to quit law school uh, because I found it almost impossible to reconcile my desire to change the world or at least the system with laws that help to perpetuate that very system. But later on, I would discover a perspective, a view of law that showed me that in order to change the law, I needed to learn the law and to master it. And that genuine change comes from within the ranks of those who are affected by it. And that in order to push for real meaningful change, often I would also need to change first change how I view the law, the role of lawyers, the roles of law and society, change how I would practice the law, how I would work towards changing the law, the legal system, and ultimately society and the world. You know? And perhaps in a, very, in a very subtle way, that was how I saw and learned the distinction between what being an activist and what being an advocate is. Uh, you know, I, if, you look at, if you look up the dictionary meaning of an activist and an advocate, uh, the, the two words mean different things, right? A dictionary meaning would tell you that an advocate is one who, who supports uh, a cause or a proposal. An activist is one who, who emphasizes direct action towards, uh, towards a particular view or a particular side. But operationally, you know, uh, we would see an activist is, as a person who speaks a lot. And an advocate is one who listens a lot. 
perhaps operationally activists incite change. Advocates ensure that the change that is incited would be sustainable and realizable. You know, both are equally important. Uh, one does not and should not cancel out the other. Because, you know, the movement for change over the years has been born, uh, B-O-R-N-E, on the shoulders of, act of many activists and activist groups. But also meaningful, progressive, and relevant changes over the years has also been born, uh, B-O-R-N, out of the negotiations, dialogues, consensus building of advocates. And in the field of work that I do, which is human rights work, you know, both activism and advocacy play major roles. Both are complementary, they're not competitive. Uh, advocacy in human rights work is necessary to push for engagement, to ensure that violations of human rights are discovered, acknowledged, and that they never again ever happen. Activism, on the other hand, is necessary to push for issues that do not enjoy you know, much exposure, to let people who are in a position or should be in a position to change uh, uh, things on those issues, that they are in a position to listen. You know? So again, activism and advocacy would go hand in hand in human rights work. And I learned this early on, uh, not, not in law school, they don't teach that in law school. I learned that outside of law school, even while I was still studying law. And I got involved with many groups that, uh, that uh, allowed me to continue to be an activist on many issues, but also taught me to become an advocate for many specific issues. Uh, Robbie mentioned earlier that you know the first time we met, it was because of an interview that he was doing of me in relation to the first case involving the, 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 the execution of, of, of Leo Echegaray, the first person to be, to be executed uh, under the lethal injection law in the Philippines. You know? And that particular experience of handling his case, you know, taught me a lot about activism and taught me a lot about advocacy. You know? That activism, while important, you know, has its limits. That at, at a certain point, you know, shouting outside the establishment uh, can, can only work if people inside are willing to listen. But that advocacy becomes essential when you're already inside the room and the person who is supposed to change things is already there about to listen. And so, you know, in, in that particular in that particular case, I learned many things. I learned that yes, it is important to be an activist to to move to prevent a law that is being passed, uh, taking on the death penalty and preventing the law from being passed. But once the law was passed and the law was being implemented, it became import important to channel, you know, to channel my energies towards ensuring that people who are in a position to change the law would be able to change the law, to equip those people, to, to give them input that would be necessary for them in order to change the law. So th that's one of many issues perhaps that has taught me, you know, uh, uh, in practical terms, uh, what activism can do, what advocacy can do, and how both are important. You know? And so maybe in the in the remaining minutes, I would, you know, and maybe during the Q and A, we could we could possibly talk about more experiences. But I'd like to, you know, I'd like to to end with uh, with a with a short anecdote, uh, and and also some maybe some practical reminders of uh, my based on my experiences of both activism and advocacy, uh, and allow me to frame them within the remembrance of the of someone whose life we are celebrating, you know? uh, the late uh, CHR Chair Chito Gascon, uh, my most indelible memory of Chito Gascon was of this uh, bearded tisoy with huge glasses and an amazing fluency in Filipino who would always end the national anthem with a raised clenched fist. In my last year of college, he was running for chair of the UP Student Council, which he eventually became, leading his party to a near sweep of the seats that year. That year, of course, was also the year that, was, uh, that led to civil disobedience. Uh, called by Cory, the Friday Yellow Confetti Rallies of Ayala. And Chito was at the forefront of that. He, of course, would later on become a member of the 1986 Constitutional Commission, a member of Congress. Later, I would meet up with him again at the College of Law when he became a student, when he enjoyed possibly the 
uh, the, the strange distinction of possibly being the only law student to have written the constitution he was studying in first year. <laughs> in the course of our professional lives, Chito and I would have many opportunities to meet up and work together. The last of which would be a manual for human rights investigation for CHR investigators. He and I would meet many times and during those encounters, you know, I would listen to Chito, this, this firebrand activist of his Nagaisang Tugon days, leading rallies of students. And I would listen to him and he would, you know, his, his passion would not be diminished. But I could see that his passion would, was already being channeled into a more productive uh, avenue. His advocacy for, for rights promotion, his advocacy for education, his advo advocacy for say, sustainable reforms in, in human rights protection. That was what he was very passionate about now. And that I, that I think was what led him to become a, a really good leader, one of the possibly the best chairs of the CHR we've ever had. And so I think he is one of the best examples of a person can both be an activist and an advocate and be good in both roles. I'd like to believe that both of us were able to evolve from being activists to becoming advocates for key issues that we thought were essential towards ensuring a regime, uh, not only of law, but also of justice, of fairness, of dignity, of compassion, and of equality. And so in keeping with this, uh, with this uh, theme no, of, uh, the more senior passing on to the younger. Uh, allow me to end with by sharing some insights on activism and advocacy and how to be both successfully. Limang uh, bagay lang, no? The first is choose to take part, right? It's a personal decision. It's a personal decision. No one else can make it for you. And because it is a personal decision, it should come with a conviction of what you believe in and what you put your, your faith in. The second would be hear, decide, and act. Activism and advocacy both require this. Hearing, not just listening. Deciding and taking action. The third would be to incite, which, is, which can be a dangerous word. Inspire, which can be an e even more dangerous word. Educate and move. Activists and advocates should be able to do all of these equally well incite ideas, inspire many, educate more, and move those ideas to realities. The fourth would be to teach and to train, to pass on the knowledge, to pass on the skills. And that's one thing that I saw Chito being very passionate about, mentoring his young staff at the CHR, mentoring mm -hmm. people whom he had never met, ensuring that the systems and the structures he put in place in CHR would continue beyond his lifetime. And the last would be, oh, open your mind, learn continuously. Uh, Chito was that way, he was curious. You know, he had a lot of ideas, he already, he was a brilliant guy, had a huge intellect, but he was always open you know, to learn, to, he was, his mind was always open. And so activists and advocates should, can and should never stop learning. Our mind should always be open to learn more, to adapt to the situation and to change, even as we ourselves, Move for change, no? Kamadali lang. Choose to take part, hear, decide, act, incite, inspire, educate, move, teach and train, open our minds, learn continuously. So, kung gusto mo ng pagbabago, madaling tandaan. C-H-I-T-O. Maraming salamat po. Okay. <clears throat> Maraming salamat, uh, Ted. You know, that, that reminds me, you know, one of the inspirations here really was, uh, as we said, Chito. But also one of his favorite things to share, he said, kung gusto mo na pagbabago, uh, you need, and he would share then the, the parable of the stone cutter. And he yes. said the stone Found cutter, on the rock. Mm, rock, he would, he would be a low, this is the lonely guy who goes up to the mountain, faces a big rock, he knows how, to, he knows he has to cut it, and he takes a small stone. And he pounds on the rock and nothing happens. He's pounding, nothing happens, but he has that faith. He has that confidence. He also has that knowledge, diba? that it will take more than 10. It will take more than 100, maybe on the thousands, maybe the 10,000. That rock will crack. That rock will break. And then he ends with this. He says, 
So what made the rock break? Sabi niya, it, it was not the last strike. It was every strike uh, that made the, the rock break. So I wanted to, I know you had that uh, line at the end, but I did want to ask you, no? so, yun ang ano ni Chito, no? um, kung gusto mo ng pagbabago, then have that kind of stone cutter's faith. Ikaw, I just want to revisit that again. Complete that sentence for us. Kung gusto mo na pagbabago, dot, 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 ano? Ah, umpisan mo sa sarili mo. Umpisan mo sa sarili mo. It starts with that decision eh, that you want. You want change. And if you decide that, then you will take the necessary actions. Yes, I've heard Chito say that many times so in, in our discussions. Uh, at the time, we would also talk about the possible reimposition of the death penalty. And I remember I, I, you know, I one one meeting in his office where, you know, he would drink his Coke and then he would, you know, we would talk about the death penalty and how some of the people who were pushing for the death penalty really didn't know the basis why they wanted the death penalty. And I remember I, I, men I mentioned the, the, the image of Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill and only to have the rock roll down over him. And that, as if on cue, sinabi na yung parable na yan. Sabi na, Ted, tandaan mo, di ba? Hindi yung huling, hindi yung huling palo ang bibiyak sa bato, mm. kundi yung patuloy na pagpalo. So, the decision to start, no, to, to move for change, the, the personal decision to say, I want change, is what will possibly lead you, no, me, for example, mm. to, to steps towards, uh, you know, uh, encountering that rock that stands in your way and to keep striking it. No? Uh, mm -hmm. So, kung gusto mo ng pagbabago, umisa mo sarili mo. You start with that. Mm -hmm. you, know? you, you may need to change uh, some part of your life, how you live your life. Uh, that, that, that would be the, the decisions that you make. No? For example, early on, I knew that I, I wouldn't become a corporate lawyer. I wouldn't become a tax lawyer. I wouldn't become you know, a, a particular kind of lawyer. I knew that I wanted to become a human rights lawyer. I wanted to be a litigator. I wanted to defend uh, people who were, you know, who were on the short, who had the short end of the stick. So mm -hmm. that by itself was the decision uh, that changed things. Diba? So, you know, pisan to don't study libre. I just wanted to add, don't sa, sa parable ni Chito na yon, he, he had a wonderful uh, line. Sinabi niya, it's, it's not the last strike, it's every strike. It's every strike, whether struck in moments of victory or in moments of frustration every strike uh, every strike counts now i wanted to ask you before we bring in our young uh, leaders and our young change makers i'm sure they have a lot of questions for you um, as well uh, but you talk about change and making the decision to change i'm just curious because now you have the benefit of hindsight and i think all of that is now boiled distilled into a lot of wisdom but looking back in in all honesty what did you need to change in yourself? Were there moments where you will now admit you were wrong in your approach? You were wrong in your mindset? Were there moments that looking back, you now realize, ah, I needed to unlearn some things? Ah, oh, oh, madami, madami, Rob. Uh, na, siguro yung, yung, yung una dun is, uh, we, we needed, I needed, for example, to, to learn from, my my many defeats no uh umpisa na natin dun, dun sa sa death penalty kasi napag-usapan natin yun no uh that was possibly one of my biggest cases no, ever i was a very young lawyer at the time i had no experience in defending the, the death penalty and for me i thought uh all i needed was passion all i needed was this burning desire to do good you know to help this guy you know with everything i had at my disposal and therefore, that should be enough. No? That should be enough. Pero hindi, hindi sumapat eh. Uh, hindi lang sa natalo siya, natalo ako sa kaso ko, pero namatay siya. <laughs> Pinatay siya. So, I mean, what mm -hmm. what worse result could there be? So, the first thing I needed to do was to take stock of that. No? Uh, how how I, I handled the test, how I, how I viewed uh, my role as, as a lawyer. No? I, and so, uh, because of that, you know, uh, Marami akong binago dun sa uh, how I would handle my next cases. Not to say that they became more successful, no? Kasi hindi naman. Uh, I think I enjoyed, uh, you know, a very a, a very consistent uh, track record in terms of 
death penalty cases. Karamihan don't talo. Uh, pero, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot from those cases. So the, the first thing really was uh, uh, how I how I handled the cases. Uh, they ceased to be simply, uh, you know, uh, subjects on, on, a, on a, in a file. No? Yung una doon is kinailangan kong kilalanin sila. No? And the insight I got from learning from them, from going to believe it almost every week, no? visiting them, no, uh, sitting down with them, learning about their family, learning about their background, uh, led me and my group flag, for example, to consider that maybe there are non-legal grounds to argue against the death penalty. And because of that, we looked into the socioeconomic profile of people who had been convicted under the death penalty. We said, look, we keep arguing, we keep saying that only the poor are affected by the death penalty. May katotohanan ba yan? May empirical basis pa tayo dyan? So we did a survey of the people in Bilibid. And of course, the results you know, came out. They validated what we, what we thought was a legal argument only. And we brought that to the Supreme Court. And then the Supreme Court eventually took notice. The Supreme Court eventually said, Oo nga, no? Totoo nga, no? So we now, we now had a document that told the Supreme Court that they could now legally say that only the poor are affected by the death penalty. That's just something I learned in law school. Uh, sa law school, natutunan ko, tingnan mo lang yung batas eh. Pag wala sa batas, sorry, right? But because of my experiences where, you know, during the death penalty, for example, napilitan ako mag-aaral. Napilitan ako mag-aaral economics, napilitan ako mag-aaral ng kahit na math, no? Yung mga ganun. I had, to, I had to look beyond what I had learned. And as you say, unlearn many things, no? Uh, and so, it, it, it was to... To paraphrase uh, Kapepe Jok, no, it was a humbling experience for a lawyer. No? Dahil marami abogado, uh, they are trained to become very, you know, uh, uh, very reliant on themselves. No? Uh, lawyers know everything. Right? But mm. when you're faced with that, no, na yung, yung pagkatalo mo, hindi lang, da, hindi lang mawawala ng pera yung kliente, mawawala siya ng buhay. Then I think at some point you need to say I don't know anything, everything, you know. And sometimes I might not even know anything. And so because of that, I had to learn that. I had to go to other fields. I had to learn. I had to ask for help from resource people, you know, uh, experts on the on eco- the economy and everything. So napilita na kung gawin yun. And so yun yun. You need some example, you know, paano ako nagbago, paano ko ginawa ng pagbabago sa sarili ko. Okay. Let me bring in our young, um, our young change makers, our young advocates, uh, activists. I don't know how they would call themselves, but I, I'll, I'll introduce everybody um, at the same time. Um, uh, Ross Tugade is a lawyer like you, following in your footsteps, I'll hazard, hazard to say, and had the privilege, in fact, of working with Chito Gascon at the Commission on Human Rights. Then we also have Ken uh, Abante, who, uh, who has this, uh, this organization, We Solve. And I'll, I'll summarize it as basically, I think, from what I understand, it's leveraging technology as well to try to solve so many things. Um, um, everything from uh, transparency, uh, corruption, all the way to uh, certainly something we all care about, traffic, uh, solving mobility um, in the Philippines. And Mayan Vital, a, a, a an economist, uh, one of the uh, uh, runners and uh, founders of Usapang Econ, who really has uh, done, which really has, along with JC Punong Bayan and Jeff Arapok, have really done wonderful work to make uh, economics not just more accessible, but really more powerful in the lives of uh, Filipinos. So I'd like to toss this to all our young change makers here, Ross, Ken, uh, Mayen, listening to Ted and knowing the things that you want to advocate for. Uh, are you picking up anything um, and what would you like to, to ask? Kung gusto mo ng pagbabago, ganun ba yun? Let me start with Ross. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Sir Ted on um certain uh, issues, one of which is the anti-terror law. And from that experience alone, and dami kong, um, and then just listening to certain, and dami kong 
uh, insights ngayon na na-realize ko, ah, ito yung moments na sinasabi ni Sir Ted na uh, we just step back and then we realize hindi pa nga natin alam ang napakaraming bagay, no? Um, siguro what I, what I want to engage is the point of um, how do we how do we um, uh, uh, how do we talk with other people with uh, not just the utmost humility but also bringing in uh, what we know to the table because I, I found that has to be a delicate balance between especially for young people like me no? um, uh, trying to communicate the fact that we have also um, some experience and uh, some insight owing to the fact that we're more exposed to certain technologies uh, certain um, a new developments in in certain fields of knowledge and sometimes i find myself contending with the challenge of how do we effectively communicate this especially with you know the older generation um pasintabi na rin po sa mga mas nakatatanda no pero i i, I that, that is a challenge that i find myself confronted with no um not just uh with the dynamic personal dynamic but also within myself uh, sometimes I find myself lacking the confidence to to assert, mm. no, assert the fact na kaya ko namang um, i-discuss tong certain point na to. And I think my ideas um, have some weight to them. And sometimes siguro nauunahan ng hiya, nauunahan ng kaba. Um, pero sa tingin ko, uh, in my experience, and, and I saw that through uh, me working with uh, with experienced lawyers, uh, in important matters na if I want to if I want to assert uh, certain ideas that I think would contribute to uh, change being triggered in a particular field or in a particular topic um, ayun, kailangan talagang uh, lakasan yung loob at maniwala dun sa capacity mo to to mm. trigger a conversation mm. so that's something I want to engage no, with, with Sir Ted and uh, perhaps also with my co-panelists, uh, how do we uh, effectively communicate our ideas and to to believe in ourselves constantly that we can be effective uh, agents? Uh, that's, uh, Ross, if I may, you're talking not only about the confidence, not just of youth, diba? Um, but also the, the confidence that of your education. Diba? Parang pinag-aralan ko to, diba? Nag-invest din ako dito. But on the other side of that, just to be clear, you're also talking about malaki din yung mga nakakatanda. Di ba? Pag, parang, and maybe even our culture. Di ba? We don't always. Mm. I mean, you, you have to defer kahit na alam mo ano. But let me phrase that to, to Ted. Ted, do you have that experience? I mean, is that a universal and perennial truth that when the youth want to engage, there is an obstacle of at least, well, if not an obstacle, at least there is something to be bridged between generations first. Yeah. Yes, actually, uh, I, I experienced that myself many years ago, and I, I find it a little strange now that sometimes I'm on the receiving end. Na, no? na realize ko na ako na yung mas ako na yung nakakatanda. No, dati ako yun eh, na ako yung uh, pasaway na laging sugod lang ng sugod. Ito yung gusto eh, ito yung tama eh, ito yung as you as Robbie you said, no, ito yung pinag-aralan ko eh, no. So, uh, how do you bridge that? Uh, in in a, in a I think in a very practical way, you no. Know, uh, I've learned that comes from that comes from developing a relationship, you no. Know? Uh, mas madali mas madali kasi yung tanggapin ng you know, someone who's on the older side, you know, someone who thinks, for example, that she or he remains to be the, kumaga remains to be the 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 sage, you know, the the guru in terms of everything in relation to that topic, particularly when it comes to the academia, you know. Uh, mas madali kasi pag kakilala mo no kasi doon nangyayari yung yung konting respeto di ba kasi syempre kung hindi hindi mo kilala mahirap no and so what what i what i tried over the years no uh, is to one try to develop a relationship no uh, you know uh, you can start with just a simple professional working relationship Later on, makita, makita doon sa relationship na yun na, okay, may konting, may konting tiwala na ito doon sa gagawin ko o sinasabi ko. Uh, may konting respeto siya doon sa opinion ko. No? And, and because people differ, no? 
I, I, I have absolutely no problem with that, no? Uh, and I, I think R Ross knows this very well. Uh, dun sa kaso na sinabi niya dun sa anti-terror law when we worked together. In fact, I, I was the one who, who suggested, no, to, to the team na uh, not many of them knew Ross. I said, no, I, I have this person that I have in mind, bilang sa international law, matindi sa research, no? Uh, magaling magsulat, no? can we bring her in? And they said, sige. Hindi nila kilala, uh, sight unseen, yung iba, hindi nila kilala si Ross, brought her in, and, you know, I think some of them, she, she had never met uh, outside of the Zoom, di ba? And then, and then later on, kita mo yung respeto eh, kasi may, may relationship na na-build, no? Uh, kita mo yung respeto na binibigay nila sa, sa opinion ni Ross, no? And so I think that, 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 that comes out of that eh. Yung, yung, ang pinakamahirap kasi, pag halimbawa, resistant at hostile. No, mahirap talagang banggain yun. So, uh, when I was when I was working as a very young lawyer, uh, my my senior partner, the 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 partner for whom the name the the firm name was, uh, 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 whose name belong on the on the firm name, no, uh, matigas din ang ulo niya. So pare kami matigas ang ulo. No, nagbabanggaan kami. I would insist na ito yun. Sir, ito yung pinakabagong case. Kasi we say, hindi, kasi ganito yan eh, dapat ganito yan. So pag nag-umpisa na siya na, eh, Ted, kasi ganito yan, tatahimik na ako. Alam ko kasi walang kwentang banggain siya dun eh. So I would just let him talk. Then later on, I would say, Pero sir, okay ba na I I send you something in writing? Okay lang ba basahin nyo? Then kung ayaw niyo pa rin, then let me know. Diba? Then I would, you know, I would write it down, I'll send it to him. Then later on, babalik siya. Medyo, kung medyo kalma na siya, nakita na niya, o nga, no? tama ka, ba pero baka pwede natin uh, ipasok din yung gusto kong sabihin. O oh, sige sir, ako bahala dyan. No, yung ganon. So there's a, there's a way around that. So, but I, I, I know that it is a struggle, particularly in the academe, uh, uh, where the, the traditions, no? the hierarchy is, the seniority is everything. No? Mm -hmm. I am not a very firm believer in that. No? I... In fact, I cringe when people call me Sir Ted. <laughs> I don't, I don't enjoy that particularly, because it ages me beyond my years. <laughs> but but, you're, you're... but it also, it also creates an artificial relationship, eh, di ba? Na lagi ko binibiro. Don't call me Sir. No, I can't afford to pay your salary. I'm not your employer, no. And so, uh, so but but I I, I find that. Maybe sometimes I'm the exception rather than the rule. Even in my generation, you know, I mm. I tend to be more open to newer ideas from from younger people. You know? I, I I like I like working with my former students, you know, who many many of whom are very accomplished already, even more accomplished than I am. And so, sa akin, wala problema yun eh, you know? But but that's because I learned that early on, <laughs> working with different people, you know, younger and older. Okay, you, you spoke about the academe when you talk about, you know, there are things na kailangan ding banggain din or hindi makailangan but inevitable binabangga mo rin. So let's get a young academic in trouble here. Uh, Mayen, uh, we're not just talking about human rights, we're talking about change in, in general. Let me start with prompting you about Usapang Econ. Diba? What was the need? What was the challenge? What was lacking? Why did you start Usapang Econ? Okay. So um, let me first connect or try to pick up a point that I got from Ted when he was, um, you know, relaying his his journey. Uh, it's I, I feel that you know some people just have that innate ability or innate knowledge of what they want to do, of what changes they want to to make in the society, and we noticed our group noticed that. There's actually quite a few people, or parang it's there are only a few voices that usually you know surface and uh, do these things or try to enact change or enforce change. And then what we realized is that because information is really lacking, so a lot of people don't know what's happening, or if not, um, they have less of an information on both sides of the story. So. Um, that's actually the very point of Usapang Econ. We want to educate more people so that they can be engaged and then they know what sort of issues they want to be engaged in and what sort of changes they can do. Because uh, I think 
I think it's not just about, I mean, we're, we're not expecting everyone to be as uh, great as, you know, luminaries like Ted, Chito. I mean, yun nga eh, parang each of us can do our, uh, mm. our own little ways. We can do little changes together. And we want to inspire people that just by the very uh, small job of voting for the right person can actually make good changes of number two of uh you know calling for accountability in your own local of uh, officials local governments um just by the fact that you are uh really trying to understand what sort of policies this government uh is adopting and then you know trying to discuss with fellow people uh fellow i guess fellow students or your family members about these issues so that you can perhaps uh, exact for, I don't know, better services from the government. You know, these are very small things that each of us can do. Mm. So, yun nga eh, um, I guess our point is that economics is very technical. It's so jargony. And siguro dahil pinag-aralan din ni, ni, ni Ted yan when he was doing, actually natuwa ako doon na sinabi mo na you went back to the evidence and then really produced the numbers to show that, oh, this is, uh, it's very skewed towards people who are um, in a certain income group. And that's mm. what we want to do din eh, just to make sure that there's social justice, there's, in, there's um, you know, inequalities are addressed. So with Usapang Econ, we're bringing these jargons uh, down to a level where people can really understand so that they are knowledgeable about these issues and so they can um they can see that actually you know the things that policymakers um, economists academics are talking about are something very relatable to them and so mm-hmm. they should really try and engage with all these conversations mm-hmm. over to you yeah. now Ted, I, I, this just reminds me no ano in the olden days <laughs> nung pina, nung, nung panahon mo, when we talk about activism and we talk about advocacy inevitable diba? the, the whole milieu was defined by martial law it was defined even the legal uh, infrastructure was defined by laws crafted by one man uh, and mm-hmm. so on and so the advocacy is also really all were geared towards that so rule of law uh, human rights uh uh democracy and so on but nowadays you look at all of these wonderful groups and we'll bring in ken later as well you have people advocating for technology you have people mm-hmm. advocating for more knowledge for uh for bringing to for making economics more more accessible no panahon badate was activism did you have that entire milieu did you have that entire ecosystem or were you literally, as you said, the one who had to, I had to go back to math, I had to go back to economics, I had to learn learn all of these things because I, or did you already have, you know, the seeds of, you know, different groups that you could also turn to na, hoy, you're the advocates here for for real economics uh, or real public health or so on. Uh, actually, tama yun, ano? Uh, masyado malawak yung, yung, yung field, but during during the 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 time that well, we were in college for example you know, towards the tail end of martial law leading to 86 uh i think the priority really was focused on really just getting rid of marcos you know, ending martial law and so when 86 came and that was when i entered law school eh, kami yung 86 batch kami yung pumasok after edsa na walang constitution and i still remember my constitutional law professor the late pecto fernandez first day of class Pasok sa kwarto, and sabi niya, this is a class in constitutional law, but we don't have a constitution, so what will we do? Ganun lang, ganun lang kasimple, di ba? So, uh, and, and, and so, at that time, open lahat, no? Even kami sa flag, uh, when I was a student, but I was already aware of flag at that time, later on I would see that the, the priorities of flag during that time na nandun pa si Marcos, really focused on, well, civil and political rights, democracy, no? ending martial law but after the after 86 makita mo kailangan ma, kailangan na tutukan yung civil uh, yung economic rights to kailangan na tutukan yung cultural rights kailangan tutukan yung uh, social rights no social justice became a very important uh, plank 
of 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 our work. You know? So lumawak siya, and with, within that period, I I think we were fortunate in batch namin. You know? Now we had so many people who had already been doing the work. You no, know? yung seeds na sinasabi mo. Uh, there were people who had been doing work on on the homeless, the urban poor, uh, mixing economics with law. For example, we had an American, uh, Owen Lynch, a visiting American professor, who was doing work on Philippine land laws and indigenous land laws. Can you imagine that an American knew more about our indigenous land laws and public land laws than Philipp than most Filipino lawyers? You know, and reading his articles, I was so amazed at how much he knew of our history. And so, ito yung lumawak bigla yung aming kailangan basahin, aming kailangan alamin, at lumawak din yung kailangan tugunan na problema. Kasi doon na papasok yung, hindi na sapat yung magiging abogado ka ng mahihirap, mawalang pera, pumunta sa korte. Kailangan maging abogado ka na alam mo rin kung bakit sila mahirap at paano mo tutulungan dahil mahirap sila. So, you needed, we needed to understand that. No? And so, doon din nag-umpisa yung pagtatayo ng napakaraming NGOs, napakaraming sentro na specializing in many of these different fields, no? Mm. Uh, you had you had people putting up uh, centers for indigenous rights, laws, land laws, natural resources, homeless, no? Iba-ibang issues. And that was because uh kumbaga for a time, no? For a time natapos yung usap usapin tungkol lamang sa civil and political rights biglang lumawak yung kailangan gawin. Hindi ibig sabihin na walang problema dati, hindi lang natutukan kasi priority at that time, no? Mm. Magkaroon muna ng pagkalayaan. Nung lumaya na, no? Lumawak bigla at kailangan nang tutukan. And so many lawyers had to sign up for that, no? Many lawyers had to respond to that need. And so many of us had to learn, no? Uh, take on new things. We had to learn this outside of law school. Na, mm. None of this was being taught in law school. Right, uh, human rights was not being taught in UP uh, as a as a formal course at that time. So, maramis amen uh, self study, <laughs> or we would you know we would be mentored by people who mm. you know who, who who would who who would know this field. No? I remember when I argued on uh, electricity rates. Sabi ko hindi ko na economics dito. So I sat down with two economic uh, uh, economists who. Who patiently you know, explained to me you know, in in idiot language you know, how I could understand the concept so that I could explain it to the Supreme Court in an oral argument. No, talaga pinagcagaan nila ako na walang walang units in economics. But you know, for me that was an experience, and I think that was an invaluable experience because it provided me the framework for learning how to take on these cases. So, mm. tama ka. Uh, I think this was an opportunity for. For many of these issues to come out, and because of that, we have so much more resources now. No, mm. uh, ang daming centro, ang daming focus uh, issues that uh, issues that are brought out because of these groups, NGOs, no, institutions that have already decided to specialize in these things. Uh, it's it's interesting what you said, no, na nung 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 panahon ng martial law. It, it was it wasn't even about democracy diba? it, the first cause was freedom diba? and freedom encompassed everything and was also you know uh, distilled down to one enemy diba? Yes. but eventually as you go into uh, people power you you actually had to then bring it down not down but you had to take it from freedom to human rights and democracy and then you had to disentangle human rights and democracy yes. And people forget uh, in this slow, slow march to whatever you want to call this particular point. You go from human rights and democracy, then you talk about good government. I was telling somebody, actually, good government. Narinig ko lang yan nung, nung binuo literally yung Presidential Commission on Good Government. It sounded funny yeah. to me. I had no idea what that meant. Then you go into governance. Then you go into transparency. Uh, then you go into all of these things. And then now you know you have a thousand flowers that have bloomed many that have specialized in so many different fields no um but you know as as society hopefully progresses you know, maybe it's an indicator um of change when people feel 
empowered and as, as well as directed to, to specialize in something because they know other peoples are holding down the fort as well in other areas. I want to bring in in particular now Ken Abante. Uh, because one, he brings in, you know, this is a field that obviously was not there uh, during martial law. Technology, the power of technology, um, how that empowers all of the different causes represented in this panel. But Ken, I want to focus on your name as well, the name of your group. We Solve. And I think generationally, it reflects di ba? Parang a change in mindset. Di ba? Parang napaka-positive naman ang attitude mo. Mm. Eh dati, lahat ng mga organization eh, is founded on a problem. Di ba? Mm. Karapatan. Task force detainees. Di ba? Yeah. Para, uh, agrarian reform. Everything is founded on a problem. Your name is anchored precisely on an attitude na we will solve. We will give solutions. Uh, mm. Do you agree with me? You think generationally, do you think there's a change in mindset in in activism, or if you don't call yourself an activist, in advocating for change? Do you think? Do you feel? Do you think that generationally there's a different attitude today? Um, actually, po, the my most of my mentors uh, are also from the older generation uh, who have taught me this attitude as well, this unwavering faith in the power of collective action. And when we say we solve, we don't mean we're going to parachute into your domain uh, and into your village and say what your solutions will be. It's not just problem solvers, but most most importantly, including problem owners to the uh, in, in the process of making collective solutions. So yun po, I think that's the that's the philosophy with which uh, we solve uh, was uh, was born. Uh, and uh, I think I learned that from uh, from from mentors and from uh, I come from Bicol. I come from I grew up in Naga. I also knew how uh, Mayor Jesse Robredo ran uh, ran Naga, and I saw how Naga improved. Uh, and I became you know awakened. Uh, namulat po ako doon sa kakayanan at uh, posibilidad na pwede palang maging ganito yung politika. Pwede palang maging ganito yung uh, gobyerno natin uh, kapag maayos yung pamamahala at nakikilahok yung mga tao at mga mamamayan sa paggobyerno uh, mas magiging mas okay uh, kahit na mahirap yung proseso mas magiging maayos yung pamamalakad uh, at uh, and and even when i was in uh, the in in college uh, the the mentors that i saw were sina Karen eh, ng mga sumilaw farmers no na nagmarcha uh, mula sumilaw bukid noon hanggang batasan para ipaglaban ang comprehensive agrarian reform program extension with reform law. Uh, nung pumunta naman po ako ng uh, Department of Finance, uh, nakita ko po yun sa mga, uh, sa mga advocates no, ng Syntax Coalition who were able to change uh, our tax laws that for a long time protected industry lobbies, uh, very powerful tobacco and alcohol lobbies, managed to change uh, and win by a vote in the Senate. Uh, I was there. That was my first assignment. Um, and uh, I... I, I was at all at the power of this collective movement to push for change, even things that they found impossible to solve. And because of that, um, it increased taxes on tobacco and alcohol to fund universal health care, managed to increase health insurance from 30% to 90%, managed to decrease smoking incidents from a third to, uh, to 20%. Um, and these are massive changes that in my mind, wow, ito pala yung, mm. ito pala yung kapangyarihan kapag magsama-sama at tulong-tulong yung mga taong ipaglaban yung isang uh, advokasya. Kaya dyan po, I think, inspired uh, yung, yung, yung philosophy namin sa WeSolve. Uh, and just to go back to the, to the question, um, I, I, I learned all of this from, uh, from, from my mentors uh, mm. who, who were also seasoned in uh, civil society organizing uh, and have, have, uh, have pushed for these fights uh, much longer than I have. Yeah, but uh, Ross, uh, Maya, and Ken, has there been anything uh, that has kept you up at night or even just you know, for a brief moment made you think, parang made you realize, wow, that's progress. I appreciate that. Galing. But is there, are there things that have made you stop and think na, parang yun? How did they do that? Do you remember any moment or any episodes in, in, in your young careers that that you look at 
anything about the Philippines that you think represents progress, yeah, that that still is a mystery on how how did this actually happen? Can I? <laughs> Baka po, ano, can I? Can I? Can I? Uh, mm. Volunteer. I think yung one one mystery, although it's a it's a very wonderful mystery, uh, is ito pong ito pong group pong na form nung nangyari yung pandemia. Uh, it was May 2020, uh, and uh, I think at that point there was a massive public transport crisis. You know, go government uh, basically said, you know, public transport will not be allowed. Uh, and uh, I think at that point there had been there had been movements that were forming around commuters' rights. No, uh, but in some like, mysterious fashion, uh, all of these advocacies, uh, all of these advocates and activists, uh, and uh, commuter groups and labor unions and um, and and rights advocates and even faith-based groups came together to form uh, you move as one coalition, uh, which is a it, which is a coalition which we support in we solve, but really. Uh, it, it pushes for safer, more humane, and more inclusive public transport. And since since the formation of the group in 2020, we were able to push for, you know, 12.85 billion pesos worth of uh, investments in public transport and active transport, like walking, cycling, uh, better mm -hmm. service contracting for transport workers. And uh, just in the previous budget cycle for 20, the 2022 budget, uh, we were able to push for an even higher budget, 13.3 billion this year. Uh, whereas mm -hmm. before, actually, literal po na, uh, just 1% mm -hmm. of the budget since 2010, 1% of the mm -hmm. 2.8 trillion budget was used for these uh, engagements. Mm -hmm. And now, um, parang wow, that's, that, that's progress. Yeah. It's a mystery to me, I guess, a wonderful mystery uh, for how those groups eventually decided to say, we will, uh, parang kebs ko sa... Kebs ko sa mga, uh, ano tawag dito, mga, uh, mga uh, silos, di ba? Alisin na natin yan. Tara, magtulong-tulong tayo. And I mm. think more of this attitude across uh, NGOs, uh, across, across different advocacy groups uh, is uh, uh, very mysterious na, na and wonderful. And I think I, I, I refer to it as a miracle, actually. Uh, a miracle yeah. of engaged citizenship. Yeah. Which I do well, fully understand yeah but well, yeah, certainly mobility is one of the things that where a lot of things happened and it's, it's certainly also one of the sectors um and communities where you you uh, very early on heard very often that mantra about that a, a, a terrible crisis a, a good crisis is a terrible thing to waste and certainly the pandemic and the need to keep it to keep the blood flowing through the economy was was uh, was proof um of that but and i think it's it's part of what you know partially solves that mystery that how how, how did people let down their guards and bring down the barriers and just in good faith jump in with with everybody to cooperate but what about you ross and and mayan are there are there things that make you that make you want to ask um each other others because we haven't no we don't we don't take time to stop yeah, uh, but now that you have this brief, you know, uh, luxury of just one and a half hours, are there things that make you want to discuss? Oh, how? Paano natin nagawa yun? How did that happen? Siguro for me, it's uh, the swiftness and the urgency by which uh, we have tried to uh, take into account and to bring to justice the perpetrators of. Um, the present human crisis in the Philippines. And of course, I'm talking about uh, the drug war, no? um, mm -hmm. which started in 2016. And although uh, the numbers have, um, have fallen throughout the years, we know it's still happening. But for me, the, the greatest miracle in, in uh, all my uh, experience with um, uh, the families of the victims the institutions and the different advocates trying to uh, bring the perpetrators to justice and to make them accountable is this unwavering commitment um, despite the risk, uh, despite the threats to their own personal security, uh, that these people who have been responsible for many, many needless deaths, 
of people who did not certainly deserve to die um are are keeping the faith in in trying to you know against all odds bring the perpetrators to justice um lalo na yung pag nakakausap ko yung mga um yung mga involved doon sa different accountability accountability measures, uh, even in my past conversations with families of uh, victims. And uh, maging yung, yung mga faces of the drug war um, accountability movement, like, for example, uh, I'll, I'll mention Father Flavi, uh, who's been very um, active in, um, in helping out um, the, the, the victims' families and the survivors as well. Uh, in my brief interactions, conversations with them, Um, I found myself always in awe of the commitment to to that very primordial notion of justice na um, may nagkasala, kailangan managot, pero yung pananagutan is not through vengeance, but um, through a process that respects human dignity. Mm. So, ang lalim, sa, y- ito nga yung parang ginadyo ko sa mga Uh, kakilala ko, kalahati ng, ng career ko as a young lawyer, nagbibilang ako ng human rights violations. So first, I started with the Human Rights Victims Claims Board and then mm-hmm. I, I transitioned to the Commission on Human Rights. Um, in four out of five years of uh, doing human rights practice, nagbibilang lang ako. I did, I've been crunching numbers. And uh, I'm I'm transitioning to a new role in the coming months, uh, still dealing with crimes against humanity and war crimes, genocide. Uh, I, I find myself you know, in that trajectory of uh, accounting for for uh, the violations that have been experienced by different people of different backgrounds. And across, across every position I've worked in, um, hindi nawawala yung sense of... Um, amazement ko and and um, sense of mm. awe and admiration for the people who who keep yeah, but, it together to to mm. work for justice. Uh, but Rosson, to think ko lang yun, ha, because honestly, it's refreshing as well as, I'll be honest, surprising uh, to hear you frame it that way. Not just as awe for the people who remain committed through this slog, di ba? But actually, if I heard you right, actually in awe of what you are framing us, it's amazing how far we've gotten in this, in this fight. Diba? When, when I would expect and have gotten used to the framing of it as, oh my God, kailan matatapos to? Walang accountability dito. Uh, if the elections go this way, walang accountability mangyayari dito. In the international stage, alam natin kung saan tayo mauuntog. But you're actually saying, no, 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 I'm in awe, not just of the people. I'm actually in awe of the progress. Uh, am, I, am I hearing you right? In terms of, um, in terms of trying to, well, to borrow Chair Chito's words, no? pounding the rock in, uh, with, with the gargantuan um, prosecutorial, you know, uh, prosecutorial challenges, uh, bringing them into account, especially in the international level, no? Ang daming naging ang daming naging balakid uh, and continuously ang daming dinadalang balakid uh, before us uh, human rights advocates and and people working on this particular um, topic this particular issue uh, just recently just last November um, the Philippine government if if I may just uh, discuss for a while the Philippine government uh, made a deferral request with the prosecutor of the ICC and saying that no everything's working here so you don't need to investigate no mm. and uh, that for me was you know as an was an indicator was a, a reminder again of um, the work that we have done so far na parang parang nakita na nila na meron talaga serious um, serious efforts to bring them to mm. account. So they, they, they are becoming rattled by, by this mm. process. But, uh, of course, I wouldn't uh, call it as a finished project. No? Mm. It's an ongoing project to seek justice and to seek accountability. Uh, siguro, it's my, I guess it's my youthful uh, sense of being naive na andito pa ako sa point ng career ko, I, I'm thinking na ang dami pang pwedeng gawin. Mm. There are a lot of creative ways to to bring them to to justice and to make them accountable uh but as it is i'm i'm 
um, trying to look at the process in a sense na uh, I'm learning a lot and I'm learning mm. from the people uh, that I work with. So uh, because of that, I, I, I want to learn more. I want to learn yeah. more and I want to push it further. No, and I certainly don't want to diminish your confidence, though. I, I, I'm not one to, to try to qualify your, I know, but, but I want to ask Ted before I, I ask uh, uh, Mayan to jump in here. But Ted, nabanggit ni Ross, her sense of optimism, and you've seen a lot of struggles, di ba? But I, most recently, still accessible to generation. If you take the example, the, a smaller example, you would think, but no less tragic, the Ampatuan Massacre. Taking more than a decade, and yon, parang literally nagmamataya na yung mga tao, and you still don't know. I mean, the progress it took, and then to look at one objective way of looking at it is you look at the drug war, you see the thousands and tens of thousands of deaths in the first two years. That really has dropped, dropped off, has slowed down. Not to say it's no longer a a crisis. But the numbers do certainly bear out that something's changing. And even in the language of government, even in the language of our representation in the international community, you do see that not just recognition, but they're being rattled, as, uh, as Ross said. So, but tarangin lang kita, with everything that you've seen, not in these causes, but in activism and advocacy, Ross mentioned the word. Is her confidence coming out of, as she said, naivete youthful ano uh, youthful naivete and confidence or objectively can you actually tell her no actually no there there are this is this is real victory and if you look at all the other human rights uh, struggles we've faced in the past the truth is there are indicators that that we're, we we've learned to do things um in a much more effective and efficient way nowadays <laughs> I, I I wouldn't say that yung optimism ni Ross no is is naive because I I I I myself no have marveled at uh, how far we've gone. Na as ako mismo nagulat no, and of course there 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 were milestones along the way, but those milestones were created no were put in place uh, were made possible because of the all the hard work that was done. And, and the courage of the people, which which Ross mentioned, you know, yung tapang ng ng mga nagpopursige, kahit na alam nilang ang hirap, no, ang hirap lumaban, no, uh, halos imposible, dahil ang laki ng kalaban, ang bangis ng kalaban, pero patuloy pa rin sila. So I think, I think, I, you know, and I, I and I agree, you know, it it is a cause for not just confidence, no, but really hope. Uh, that that uh, that there will there will be change, you know, along this line, and 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 at such speed, no. Uh, siguro realistically, when when the killing started, no, almost immediately after the this administration took power, no, after the shell shock had worn off, many were probably saying in their minds, "Kailangan natin ang time mawala tong administration." Then then maybe then maybe we can start prosecuting. And then you know, someone started to push. No, ito na yung pagpalo sa bato. No, now someone started to push again. And then, and in the middle of the drug war, and then you, and then you notice the change in the narrative. Then you, then you notice the, the na nararatel na sila. Then you notice the the affirmative steps now being taken. They're much more defensive in their public statements. No. Nagkikita mo nagbabago yung policy kasi alam nila conscious na sila na ito yung possibly mangyari, no? And so and so from the from a time na tinatrumpet na lang yun as an achievement, they're now trying to hide it, no? They're now trying to be they're being very defensive about it because they know na ultimately wala silang mapupuntahan. And so I think that is really a basis for confidence. And so I I really wouldn't put it as a as part of naivete, no? Talagang ano yan, there, there really is an objective basis for that. Of course, uh, you know, we all know that hindi pa naman yan yung panalo, no? But uh, I, I always say, you know, we, we take the small wins, no? We take the small wins because they sustain us, eh. They sustain us for the bigger wins ahead, no? So in the middle of all of the losses, all of the trials, we take the small wins, and this is a this is a small win, you know, in the in the larger scheme of things. This is a small win, but it's a win nonetheless that we get mm. the 
prosecutor to, to open up an inquiry and we get government to formally recognize no, by asking for a deferral. Just by the mere asking for a deferral, kahit na hindi nila makuha, that by itself is a victory. Kasi kita mo, kinikilala na ngayon nila bigla na mukhang sandali, mukhang may, may tama tayo dito. No, mukhang may hulog tayo dito. So that by itself is a victory. Na not not yet the final, not the final one, but that by itself is a victory. And so yes, definitely, there's there's basis for there's basis for being hopeful. There's basis for being confident. Uh, uh, Mayan, let me let me recast this a bit specifically for you because there is there is usapang ekon is particularly involved in a social challenge, a social problem that really is unique and really is being honestly being born in your generation but maybe not maybe you've had revisionist um in history revisionists in in many countries you 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 in germany has had to contend with it um, many uh, many nations that have had to contend with genocide have had to contend with uh, revisionist history and gaslighting on a societal uh, level but in the philippines really this task of really fighting not just fake news, but really uh, the, the revisionist history when it comes to to um, the Marcos years, martial law, <clears throat> and particularly the economic uh, um, impact and, and reverberations that has had uh, to this day is really unique to this moment in time and really unique to your generation. Um, how, how does that feel? Uh, being at the forefront, um, and you know, I, I don't know if this was a conscious thing, right? it, it certainly become a, a focused issue at this point. But I imagine when Usapang Econ was born, it was really, you know, broadly speaking, the empowering nature of economic education, of making it accessible to people, allowing them to make their own decisions, allowing them to participate in, in political economic um, uh, discourse, and the things that affect their lives. And then all of a sudden you see yourself also at the tip of the spear of having to fight something that we were almost like deer in headlights um, in suddenly coming to realize oh my god it's it's here and you know uh, but but how does that feel as an advocate to suddenly have an activist um, uh, uh, role here and how daunting uh, is it okay so actually you read my mind ruby i was about to ask you if mine can be negative like something that keeps me up um and that's really disinformation um so i'm just going to look back in one of our podcasts where we invited um, a researcher who's done research on disinformation and has actually gone into the ground of how big the troll industry is in the philippines so you know, it, it, the problem of revisionism, uh, rev sorry, revisionism, of course, is not is actually bigger than it seems. Of course, revisionism can uh, happen not just in, in online media. You know, it could also happen even in the education sector and, you know, in the types of books that are available to students, you know, the type of lessons that are being given, you know, the kinds of assessments and exams, as well as just the regular informal conversations at home. But let's face it, you know, online media is something that a lot of us rely on when it comes to information. And I just um, I just wanted to say that, you know, learning from that podcast where we saw how everything is just so systematic, um, the kinds of information that means to inflame people. And I'm sure you've watched it. There's also these documentaries on uh, Cambridge Analytica and how they take advantage of social media to influence people, and uh, you know, parang use that information para isway or para i reinforcing biases. So, what what having you know learned all that, I think we are in a good position. Well, Usapang Econ is in a good position to try to right some of these wrongs. Of course, you know, we're not an expert on many things. We can only uh, we can only touch upon, you know, economic concepts uh, or at least uh, discourses that relate to economics. And we've done that in our podcast on martial law. So we've tried uh, 
to to present evidence on the contrary of what they're saying that okay martial law was the golden era you know everything was great the economy was um, at its highest it, there's so much equality nobody's poor but then in our podcast we were able to dissect all these parang misconceptions about martial law that no that's not the case because you know if you look at the actual data you know, we weren't leading the pack mm. in even in ASEAN. Um, and in fact, what happened was after martial law, it resulted in decades after parang oppor lost opportunities. Kasi nag-dip talaga yung, yung economic growth natin. Nag-dip yung per capita incomes natin. Such that um, nag-lag tayo behind other countries. So that's one of the reasons why we're called the sick man of Asia. And the, another thing is that, you know, there, there could have been so much that, uh, that could have been done during martial law, but, you know, didn't, that, that they wouldn't, they were not able to do. So, on mga infrastructure projects, but really a lot of these infrastructure projects are not being used. Okay, and if you compare the amount of infrastructure projects, yes, marame, because look, how long were they in power? Of course, you have to expect that they should have these projects, but were they um, reaping the investments or the returns to the investments? Nakatulong ba siya in the long-term growth? Well, not really. So we have these huge complexes, edifices that don't really produce much. I mean, look at Bataan Nuclear Power Plant. We had to borrow lots of money, but you know, these are this is just a white elephant. This is just there. Wala siyang, um, you know, benefit. So, uh, in other words, I think in Usapang Econ, uh, having that space to um, inform people about, you know, these, um, the, the, these, uh, the, sorry, the misconceptions and what's really happening probably helps a lot of people when it comes to making their own decisions about um, mm. what they should be looking for in, in terms of governance, in terms of government. And second is that, of course, um, we also want to, to inform people that, you know, you have to be, you have to take things with a grain of salt. Now, just because people say na ganito, it doesn't mean it's true. So just by juxtaposing the gossip and the actual evidence would probably mm. convince people that maybe everything is not what they see. Yeah, but but, but my, let me throw <laughs> this to all the young people here. So Ted, to mabiga na muna, because obviously this is not a question for you, na, nor even for me, di ba? Um, so let me take the, the problem that Mayan uh, proposed and throw that back to the people who will be confronting this for the rest of your lives. Diba? What do you do? Um, nung panahon namin ni Ted, at least, actually now to think about it, it was easier to fight monolith, monolithic media. Um, because it is easy to boycott. You boycott them, it, it, it breaks their, their, it breaks their uh, business model, it hurts their political patrons, and that's it, you're done. Diba? And, but now, question that you're raising we throw it back to you so what's your generation's answer uh so far how do you solve a problem like social media and and, and the disinformation and and the fact that you have no control I, because my end I'll, I'll again i'll just um uh, instigate uh, it based on something that you said about we just have to juxtapose everything but all the studies uh, show, including the, the the guys who did the research that you you interviewed in 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 your podcast, also say that facts don't work. I mean, I'm sorry, being blunt, but it's not a matter of giving them facts, um, uh, and that's not the that's not actually um, the silver bullet. So, I know honest question here, baliktad naman from an older generation to you. Ano plano niyo dito? What a tough question, sir. Ay, bawal pala mag-sir. <laughs> what a tough, what a tough <laughs> question, Robbie. Uh, siguro, I, I just wanted to also, I, I sal super saludo ko sa, uh, sa, I mean, everyone in this panel, really, uh, for, for really pushing hard on things that seem insoluble. Um, I wanted to, 
to preface my my answer by sharing an experience also I had with the the late uh, uh, Chito Gascon uh, because when we were building the Marshall Museum in 2017, um, he was the one actually who uh, who introduced us to the Human Rights Victims Claims Board, uh, and he was mm-hmm. instrumental in that uh, in in some of our early partnerships uh, with the board. Uh, and when we were consulting for how to build the Marshall Museum in 2017, uh, we we also consulted with Secretary, the late Secretary Mon Jimenez, uh, about how do you persuade people to uh, to actually uh, I don't know to, to 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 how how do you inoculate people from this type of disinformation? Um, and prescient na siya, di ba? Vaccination na kagad yung <laughs> yung terminology na ginagamit ni. Uh, Sek Monje nung time na yun. Um, and he was saying also the same thing. Uh, facts are not enough. Uh, and it was important to go back to, you know, parang first principles. Uh, and he, in his strategy somewhere, sinasabi niya, uh, there's a certain point where you don't even need to name the word Marcos. Uh, start with the first principles of why is it important to have to have democracy, di ba? Kasi nakakasagasa yung pagiging diktador. Uh, and and he, was, he, was, he was saying that, so that was the first insight that I got. Parang it was so important to go back to the first principles about why it's important to not have a dictatorship. And you don't have to talk about Marcos directly for people to understand those first principles. Uh, the second thing, uh, I think, yung, uh, one, one wonderful student leader who we were consulting about this uh, mentioned how it was so important to not view people as votes but view people as people uh, at yung tiwala yung tiwala parang babalik medyo in a certain extent parang babalik ulit sa first principles it's what uh, Ted mentioned a while ago yung yung trust yung relationship sa mga tao uh, and and perhaps what made uh, what's making this much worse uh, and what's making it harder to inoculate people from this type of disinformation is we probably lost touch with our grassroots communities. Uh, to, pa, baka dapat bumalik tayo dun sa mga, uh, sa, sa mga relationship ng tiwala at babalik ka dun sa barangay, babalik ka sa pamilya mo, babalik ka uh, uh, sa mas first principles ng organizing, which mm. is to focus on people's relationship and trust uh, mm. and not people's votes. You don't talk to people to convert them to vote a particular candidate. You talk to them because you care. Mm. Uh, um, first and foremost. So I, yeah. I, 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 so I don't have solutions. <laughs> but those were two, those were two principles that I think uh, would form, uh, you know, the form whatever strategy there is. But certainly, I think at this point, um, it's important to go back to those principles. Yeah, but to that point of going back to the grassroots, and for that matter, going back to your community ross i i know from your facebook post you went home to the north diba? it i mean meron kang political uh meron kang dinadalang kandidato i know that but my question is amy not so much about sinong inaano mo but you did go to the north back home uh, from what i understand that's your um your hometown to carry out legal uh the free legal assistance and free legal work all part of your ambag for your own political uh, convictions. But take away those, you know, kung sino man ang ini-endorse mo. Um, I'm just curious, to Ken's point, as you go back home, go back to the grassroots, get back and touch base with your people, what did you learn in those few days about their vulnerability as well as the faith that we should still have in them? You know, sir, no, that's the word exactly for it. The, the vulnerability um, to disinformation and um, all these um, uh, active uh, distortion of historical fact. And I found that uh, in my brief uh, volunteer work uh, last Christmas, na the the number one rule of thumb at least uh during my experience uh doing that uh is is to to converse uh with people uh seeing them as equals uh hindi hindi with the aim of converting their vote uh not with the aim of um correct 
accepting what they know because those are from their lived experiences. And we can't invalidate all their lived experiences. Kung naranasan ng mga, yung, lalo na mga kamag-anak ko dito, mga nakausap ko, um, naranasan nila na nung panahon ng, ng martial law, uh, okay naman, tahimik, walang, uh, walang problema dito sa Norte for the most part in their lived experience. And who am I to invalidate that lived experience? But I guess it's, um, it's the, the conversation should be to, to help navigate um, this um, space that we are in right now, which is, you know, for the most part, social media. And I found na ang effective na strategy dyan is uh, to let them know of the bigger picture na ako, I, I also spoke from my experience na ako nagtrabaho po ako sa Human Rights Victims Claims Board at naranasan ko na mabasa at makausap yung mga biktima ng martial law. Uh, hindi porket naging maganda yung karanasan natin dito sa Norte ng martial law it's the same thing for everyone in the Philippines. And uh, during martial law, uh, ito yung naging mga narratives na, na, na narinig ko personally, nirelay sa akin, uh, na, naranasan ko na iyakan na ako ng isang claimant kasi nalaman nila paso na yung claim nila, hindi sila nakapag-claim on time. And then every time I remember those things, the narratives I've read, it breaks my heart no, na um, for some people, um, this wasn't real. This this is part of um fiction for them. And ang sakit sakit na na ako personally na kasalumuha ko yung mga biktima ng martial law. And even until now, it's parallel to my experience with the drug war, naman documentation and and efforts at accountability. Ah, uh, people would say, "Ima mga adik yan, eh, kaya pinatay." And I would I would approach people in the same manner na um actually sa karanasan ko na nakausap ko ang mga kaanak na mga biktima ng ng war on drugs mm. this this isn't this isn't true what they're telling us na na kaya sila pinatay kasi addict sila it's 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 not the truth di ba so malakas yung talab ng ng karanasan um malakas ang ang uh, kumbaga um malakas yung yung epekto niya na mang mang, mang persuade no uh, in terms of of persuading people not just to to believe in a particular candidate but to uh, reorient themselves towards um towards historical truth uh kailangan first and foremost to ground the conversation as equals not to not to, mm. not to treat them as um mga mga bayaran or niloko or whatever but to 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 honor their 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 viewpoints first and to converse uh, from the level of experience. Yeah, but uh, Ted, uh, I hear, I, I think we all hear what uh, Ross is saying and really always powerful when it's a personal uh, testimony of, you know, of, you know, um, kahit anecdotal, uh, the power of that. I mean, literally, Ross going up that mountain and then uh, doing one strike, two strikes um, on that rock. So th there's a lot of hope there. But Ted, let me just be honest with you. It sounds so tiring. Diba? If, if, I'm, if, if in this wave that I see coming, diba? in this, speaking of what Chita was referring to as in moments of um, victory and moments of frustration, you strike that rock. Yeah, but it feels like I'm going to strike this rock in a moment of frustration. Um, and even when I hear that, you know, when, when, you know, that you have these people, these young people, who are still striking their stones and pounding that rock. I take it all in, and then I imagine the future that they will build, but it just feels so long. <laughs> really? One by one? Eh, yung nangapanya dito, parang balita ko, it took them 10 years of investment in social media. Na naunahan na tayo, and then we're gonna catch up by talking to people one by one. I guess my question to you, Ted, and this is by way of starting to bring us back to our lessons here what's your perspective on time now you've been an activist and advocate for 30 years you've had moments of victory you've had moments of frustration but when you take the, all that in and then you realize that oh no, no shit 30 30 plus years now what's your take what's your perspective on time oh Yes, I, I agree with you, Rob. It, it can get really tiring and there are really days when it's all you can do to, you know, get up and, you know, 
go to go to work. But on on the other hand, there are days as well where you can't, you know, you you can't get up early enough because you know that you know, meron kang pwedeng gawin. You know? So I think it's a it's a it's a matter of balancing those two and finding a way to continually motivate uh, yourself you know, and others, you know, maybe of our generation. Because I know that many of our, from our generation would tend to take the easier track na lang and say, alam mo, marami na kami nagawa eh. Kayo na muna. Kayo na naman. Or kayo na muna. Pahinga na muna kami. You know? Pero uh, I'd like to believe that uh, uh, meron pa rin namang magagawa then marami pang kailangan gawin. You know? So, What's my perspective in time? Uh, I I'm trying to remember the exact quote, but I I can't at the moment. So I'm paraphrasing uh de Job, no, who paraphrased uh, Nikos Kazantzakis uh, that when he said that the the superior the superior virtue is to struggle under time but under the aspect of eternity, meaning that we have our call for each particular time, no, but uh, we re- we remember that uh, what we do. Maybe time bound, but uh, when we do as much as can within the time that we are given, you no, know, uh, we trust that things will happen, you no, know, uh, eventually. Possibling uh, magiging swerte tayo na makikita natin yung fruit na ginawa, ginawa natin. Pero kung hindi tayo papalarin, then I think we can rest assured that during the time we were given, we did as much as we could, and that that. Uh, Paraphrasing Kasantakis uh, and Jokno is the superior is the superior virtue to struggle under that time that we have, no? but always under the perspective that this is a much bigger struggle. This is an eternal struggle. Okay. Well, speaking of time, I know we have abused yours uh, already in the one and a half hours that we've been speaking. But really, um, it, this is really uh, a lot of timeless lessons that we've taken, and really um, we we appreciate all of your time. I just want to hand off as a final and to end to close this entire program with my personal thanks to Ted, to Ross, to Ken, and to Mayan. I'd want to bring in the CEO of Puma Podcast, uh, Carl Javier, for our closing message. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for all of the insights, for all of the stories. Uh, it's, it's an important conversation to have and I have a few reactions along to it. Uh, one thing that I've really attached myself to, as, as you all have been speaking, um, is the piece of the title that says, kung, kung, gusto mo ng pag, kung gusto mo ng pagbago, yung kagustuhan. Uh, because I feel that um, it was the experiences that you had lived through that it made it apparent to you. But what I feel now is when we talk to people, we forget, and we, because we have that fire, we forget that the, the majority of people actually are kind of okay, medyo mas madaling sumunod sa status quo than, than to move towards change. And, and I was thinking, you know, there are people who say they're fine. And, 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 and as was mentioned, for example, yung mga tao na nagsabi na, okay naman kami nung panahon ng martial law or things were fine hindi naman, and especially in the drug war hindi ako apektado or the um, okay naman sa subdivision namin kasi mas na feel ko na safe and bringing them to a thinking that there needs to be some kind of change the people who are perfectly comfortable or benefit from a status quo and the other is the people who feel totally overwhelmed yung sa dami dami ng problema kailangan ko sumweldo uh, you know, dinadak ako ng HR kapag late ako ng five minutes uh, office. It, you know, those kinds of concerns. And then they're so tired. And then they turn, and then we turn around and we tell them, hindi kasi kailangan natin laban ito. And so, I, I was thinking about those people and how this conversation might provide the initial steps for them to first start thinking about it so that they can take the first steps. And for me, the the big step that I saw here uh, that we can equip the people who are who will uh, start working for change is the understanding um, that if you fight for change it is uh, sa fighting it it goes into championship rounds walang one mm-hmm. round knockout of change mm-hmm. and 
and to build a framework where it's a long game. You, you don't walk into a fight, you train for it, but once you have your training, it's still going to be a struggle and you don't know when exactly it will end and you might have to pass it off. Like all of these sports metaphors can come into play, but this idea that change is something that is going to be uh, difficult, right? The, and it's going to take uh, so much work. And I think that we kept coming back to those images of, um, of putting work in and then handing that work off to other people because you might not be the one who finishes this piece of it. So um, those are the key takeaways for me. So, so thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks to our partners, uh, Asia Society Philippines, Youth Led, um, and also inviting everyone to go to the Puma Podcast website, sign up for the newsletter, uh, and follow this series. Hopefully, from this first uh, stream all the way on to the end, we will have brought people to a point na gusto na nila ng pagbabago. <clears throat> maraming salamat, uh, maraming salamat, Carl. And once again, we'd like to thank, on behalf of Puma Podcast, Asia Society Philippines, the Asia 21 Young Leaders Youth Led uh, Bukas. Um, um, am I forgetting anybody else? And everybody, of course, our panelists uh, who joined us today: Ted Te, Ross Tugade, uh, Mayan Vital, and Ken Abante. Maraming maraming salamat po, and thank you to the family of Chito Gascon for whom this series, this uh, kung gusto mo ng pagbabago, the Chito Gascon Leadership uh, uh, Series is named after and whom we honor. Maraming maraming salamat po. Okay. Thanks.